But we'll begin our reading with verse 36. This is after he had come to that place called Golgotha, place of a skull, and they crucified him and parted his garments to fulfill prophecy. And they watched him on his cross, set over his head, the accusation which is in truth, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So this is where we pick up our reading in God's word, Matthew 27 and verse 36. Let's hear God's word. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And upon the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. May God bless his word to us, and may we remember it and know it always. Well, in our preparatory service on Wednesday night, we considered Jesus. We saw him as the bride of Christ ought to see him, ought to always see him, as he that is altogether lovely. He that we say is our beloved. He that is our friend. And we wanted to shout, as it were, from the rooftops, this glorious one in whom all divinity shines forth so beauteously is our bridegroom in whom we have all blessedness. We saw his glory. We saw his super excellency that shines in the person of Christ, the chiefest of 10,000, greater than any other beloved that we could have. And in all we said, as we saw him in these ways, this is my beloved, and this is my friend. Today we behold our beloved, And we behold our friend on his cross. We hear a most awful sound to those of us who are in the state of grace. Our beloved Jesus groaning on his cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are the opening words of the 22nd Psalm as we have just heard. These are one of the seven sayings that our Savior had on the cross. This is the fourth of the seven sayings. Therefore, children, you know this. This would make it the middle saying, perhaps the pivotal one. These words that he uttered when he, as the sin bearer, felt the full force of God's wrath bear upon him for the sins of his people. God's vengeance breaking forth against the sin bearer in the place, in the room of those of you who have faith in him. To know these words uttered from the depths of the Savior's misery is to know how, as we heard on Wednesday night, your beloved has dove's eyes for you. Just how much he pities you just how much he loves you, just how much he cares for you, that he was willing to endure that in your place, beloved of God. How tender and full of pity the Savior's heart is that he would undergo the torments of hell 
for those of you here who believe on him and those of you who will believe in him. This is to understand these words, is to understand Christ for you in the sacrament that we're about to partake of. It is to know Christ for you. Christ giving himself for you as a sacrifice to God, bearing what you can never bear so that you might have every blessedness, so that you, the believer, will never have to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he, your beloved, was forsaken in your place, in your room, in your stead. So today we want to have an answer to the question posed in Christ's cry. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Every Christian must know the answer. It's a blessed thing to consider. And we'll have three answers to consider today, which form our headings. There could be more, but these are three of the primary ones. And first is the holiness of God. That's the first answer. The second answer will be only Jesus could be forsaken for us. Thirdly, it will be the love of God. Now, these three answers were not mysterious to our Savior. He knew them full well. I trust you know. He knew why he was forsaken. But he expressed this saying as an expression of his great misery and sorrow, and you're also going to find as an expression of his faith, that he understood full well from the counsel of God what he was doing, that when God's wrath was appeased, he knew that he would say, it is finished. He would give up the ghost. He would give up his spirit and know by faith that all had been accomplished for his people. Because the 22nd Psalm will consider this as well. He begins with it, but he knows how it ends as well in triumph, in victory, that his seed will arise to do his will, that he will save definitively his people because he was forsaken in their place. Begins with misery, ends with triumph, but more on that later. So let us first consider the first answer to why God had forsaken him, which is God's own holiness. Now, I will be in Psalm 22 quite a bit. You may want to be there or have a finger or your place there as well, because it informs what we are about to hear in this sermon. Well, as we open this heading, from the time of Gethsemane, the human nature of our Lord Jesus Christ had lost his sense of divine comfort. You know, in Gethsemane, an angel from heaven was dispatched to strengthen him. You'll notice that God, the divine nature, is not directly ministering to our Savior from this time. He must endure the wrath of God all on his own in the human nature. Though he will get strength from the angel, he will not get comfort from the angel. He will be devoid of comfort from God during this time. From Gethsemane to his giving up of his life on the cross, Jesus did not know God's comfort. It is as though heaven itself had been shut up to the Savior. All of his prayers, all of his pleas, he would have to go before God by faith that they were received. However, he would not feel comfort from the Lord in it. And sometimes I trust you pray in such ways and you do not feel that God is there hearing you, but by faith you know he does. And Jesus is living by faith in this time because he knows God is not against him, but he must endure these things for the sake of the elect. And when he comes to the cross and those three hours of darkness these become the most intense three hours of darkness where God's wrath is poured on our sa- upon our Savior on Calvary's cross. Most intensely communicated to us when our beloved quotes Psalm 22, verse 1. Now let me read the entirety of that verse from the psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what we have cited by Matthew here. But what's the rest of the verse? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? In the Savior, right? It's as though he feels that God is so far away from him, so far removed from him. He's forsaken. He, he prays and he pleads in faith 
and yet he does not have a sense that God is near him. He is forsaken, and God is so far away. In response to his pleas, it's as though there is total silence from God. He was deserted in a sense. God would not help him far from it. What a thing that is to think of. Or you think of a silence from heaven to the Savior after having such intense communication with God for 33 years, from the time he was an embryo, right? The divine nature is, is bound inseparably in this hypostatic union, such sweet fellowship with God. And now there's silence for the first time in his agony. And it doesn't seem as though God is there to help him anymore. What a thing this is for the Savior. There was a, a depth of anguish here that, you know, when, when Christ says this, he would not have said it dispassionately. And no matter how I say it, it will never communicate to you carnally the depth of passion and pathos in the Savior's human nature here. But by God's Spirit, we can know something of it. If he is here in your heart. You can know something of the Savior's travail. You can know something of the anguish that he felt there on the cross. And if you hear it by the Spirit's power, your heart would be just as wrenched as Christ's back was on that cross. To hear the Savior groan these words with such intense anguish, why art thou so far from helping me? And the words of my roaring. Brethren, Hear the holy, undefiled Savior cry to his God and feel as though he's groaning into a dark vacuum. Psalm 22, verse 2. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. Do you get that? I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. He cries out to God, but thou hearest not. That's his sensation of it. And he feels God does not hear. Now, we think here of our Lord on the cross. He was on the cross for six hours. He died at 3 p.m. That's how the Jews count time here as we think on the hours on the cross. And you might even ask, why did he say he cried in the day and in the night if he dies at 3 p.m.? Well, certainly part of that has to do with his roaring, which began in Gethsemane, clearly at night. But I think what we are drawn to as he's crying out on the cross is what we heard of in Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. The sixth hour being noon or midday by the way the Jews counted their hours. Um, and what has happened here as you think on this darkness, as Spurgeon said it so memorably, the midday had become midnight. And as the Savior is groaning, you think of this, he doesn't hear an answer to his prayers, and he's plunged into darkness. Why? Why is light gone from the land in these three hours? Well, because God had sent outer darkness to descend upon the Savior. Jesus Christ, think of it, children, the light of the world plunged into outer darkness as God's wrath descends upon him. The power of God's wrath in hell is upon the Savior. You remember, children, how the Savior called hell outer darkness. And so the Savior must suffer outer darkness on the cross. He's experiencing, this is a tangible picture of what his soul is undergoing. The darkness that surrounds the earth. That the power of God's wrath is descending on him. He's experiencing in this time the full terror and the full fury of God's wrath for sinners. This is far worse than the floggings and the beatings and the spittings and the crown of thorns and everything else that the Savior endured outwardly that you saw. This is far worse. The torments of hell, the great misery of the cross is the wrath of God. So let's consider for a moment the Savior's experience in those three hours. His cries seem to be unheard. His vision cast into blackness, unable to see. No one to hear him, he feels, 
as he is plunged into the crucible of God's anger. And what must that have been like? Can we have a fellowship with his sufferings for a moment and meditate on what that must have been for the spotless Lamb of God to endure? Could you imagine it? You might ask why. Why must he endure it? Well, Psalm 22, verse 3, reveals the Savior knew why. He said to the God that did not seem to hear, but thou art holy. Thou art holy. I know why I'm enduring this. It's because thou art holy, O God. Do you see the faith that was in the God-man? That though he said, right, God, you don't hear me, or it appears you don't hear me. I will still speak to you, God. And I will, by faith in your word, tell you that I know exactly why I am forsaken. Because thou art holy. I am forsaken of God because God is holy. And you might ask, why in the world? Because Jesus was holy. Jesus was perfect. Jesus is sinless. What does he who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, being totally holy, why does he have to face the wrath of God, a holy God? Christian, do you know? Do you know? Can you say to God why Jesus was forsaken? Because God is holy. It is your iniquities and mine too. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That is who we are. We are unholy. We are sinners. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is why the sinless, spotless Lamb of God must suffer. The Savior made our substitute. Our guilt, Christian, placed on the head of the Lamb of God, imputed to him, counted as his own, counted, not just counted, owned as his own. Though he was not guilty, He becomes guilty and accursed before God and man to carry away our sins. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made what? A curse for us as it is written. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. His soul was tormented by God. Think of this. His soul tormented by the wrath of God for you, Christian. For you. The torment you deserve on him. Every bit of it, every ounce of it. All of God's judicial anger against your uncleanness, against your hatred of God, against your hatred of neighbor, against your unwillingness to to bend the knee to Christ himself, strangely, is put on him. Yet it pleased the Lord Please the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Words could not begin to convey to you or to me the sufferings of his soul for our sins. You see his body already brutally mangled and beaten and bloodied. But here his soul, these torments that he underwent in his soul, uh, Man cannot communicate to you what those were like. The terror of God for an innumerable number of saints, what must that have been like? Words cannot convey it. But Jesus did suffer body and soul because if you, the sinner, must suffer in hell body and soul, so must the Savior in your place. All that travail, the power of hell, descended on him in darkness. You know, we speak far too flippantly, don't we, of, maybe you've said it, I've said it and had to repent of it, 
of experiencing a personal hell, right? We might say that of ourselves because we're going through a trial or a difficulty. We ought never say that. That is blasphemy. Here is the only one who has experienced a personal hell and not for him, but for you and for me. He can truly say, I experienced hell personally on the cross for you, my beloved. Oh, how he loves. See how he loves. The fire of hell upon his soul, the torments of hell upon his back and his head and his limbs. Hell in all of its dimensions in the blackness of night is upon our Savior those three hours on the cross. He had become a total Holocaust offering to God for us to bring us to God. Now, I mean absolutely no disrespect to any who suffered under the hands of the Nazis, but to call that a Holocaust is actually not to understand what a Holocaust is rightly. Here is Jesus Christ, who is a true Holocaust, total burnt offering to God. That is a Holocaust offering. Let your heart not be more moved by the plight of the Jews there in World War II than for your own beloved Savior. Here he is, the Jew who's become a Holocaust. Here is the one who has truly suffered to save men. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Here in our text then is what the, the Puritans called the great exchange. Jesus taking our sins on himself with all the due punishment, right? It is not just a, you know what? This is just a business transaction. I'll take their debt. You get my righteousness. No, all the due penalty and punishment goes on him as well so that you can get all the due blessedness of one who is holy and righteous and blameless. What an exchange. What an exchange. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's his part of the bargain. So that you may receive, enter into the eternal joy of the Lord. That's the contrast on the cross, isn't it? We receive his righteousness and his blessedness. He takes our curse and he takes our sin. And when you prepared for the Lord's Supper this past week, you dove into your heart to search out sin, I trust. You saw the uncleanness of your heart. You saw the filthiness of it. You even saw the lukewarmness of our faith as we considered it last Sabbath uh, evening. Here is the one who's altogether lovely. He says, open to me, my love, and, and we're on the couch, slumbering spiritually. Well, you brought all of that in repentance and faith to the beloved this week. And I trust you know his forgiveness and his love and his mercy to cover you all. But all of that sin had to be judged. It had to be paid for. You received cleansing and forgiveness and you were glad and joyful for it. But that sin had to be punished and God owes you wrath for it. And Jesus, for every bit of sin you found, you know, as much as you mourned over what you had done, you perhaps had not thought of what he had done in order to atone for it. As has been said by better men, he endured hell so that you may enjoy heaven. But this notion or truth that we deserve wrath for sin has become quite unpopular, even in the church today. But John 3.36, so that you never, ever lose sight of it, says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There is wrath abiding on the unbeliever. God must have judicial wrath for sin, and that wrath needs removal from you as a sinner. It must either go on the one who groaned on the cross or else it remains on you. This is why we are glad, those of us with faith in the Lord, that there is no longer wrath abiding on us. But, you know, sometimes that's just too shallow, isn't it? Because we don't remember where it went. We don't remember where it went 
It had to go somewhere. It cannot just disappear and evaporate all on its own. But Christ says to the Father, Give me thy wrath, O God, and give them thy blessed mercy. Children, this is what God calls a propitiation. And what that word means is that Jesus took, in his atonement, took away God's wrath for you who believe. So unless God's wrath is removed, God's wrath abides because all of us, myself included, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so all sinners have God's wrath abiding on them. Even the littlest children here, believe it or not, have God's wrath abiding on them lest they, unless they have faith. But the beautiful words in the scripture are, but God. God in his mercy and pity and love set Christ, as he's setting, us, setting him before us in this text, to be a propitiation for the sin of all who would believe on him, all the elect of God, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Romans 3.25. Oh, the love of God to set forth his son to be a propitiation for our sins, to be as a lightning rod, as it were, on that cross, by which the blast of God would come upon him so that it wouldn't come upon you and me who believe. What a thing that is, to have Christ roasting, as it were, under the wrath of God's power, the power of God's wrath, so that none of it, not a spot of it, not if I could press the analogy, not a bit of static electricity remains for you and I who believe. There is no wrath but love and mercy for us. Oh, that we would take shelter under Christ's almighty wings by faith. Thinking of the Savior who purposed, as we read even in Ephesians, if we think on these eternal matters, the Savior who in that great covenant of redemption said, Oh God, I go, the Son of God saying, I go into the world to take their sins willingly, pour it out on me, because we love the elect so much. But there is wrath abiding on the unbelievers among us. Wrath. Wrath. Horrifying wrath. And if God did not spare his own son, why do you think you're going to get off scot-free, unbeliever? If God would not spare the one who is most precious to him on that tree, cursing him in a way that all who do not believe the gospel deserve, why do you think he's going to make an exception for you? He won't. Otherwise, Christ died in vain. However, all who receive him by faith will be saved from the wrath of God. Repent and believe as all who come to this table have repented and believed and you will be saved from the wrath of God. When you see the bread broken and the wine poured into the chalice, you see how the wrath of God was poured out upon the Savior, broken. You see the blood of Christ that atones for the sins of the world and you can have it by faith. Else the wrath that he endured, you will endure eternally and we'll talk on why in a bit but you will endure it eternally, but you can have mercy today if you simply flee to the Savior. Why not? Why not take the mercy in Christ? Do you love your sin that much you're willing to die and perish eternally in it? Oh, what a fool you would be. Believe and know that the wrath of God has been transferred to the Savior. Well, the first answer to the question My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is because God is holy and the elect of God are unholy sinners. So let's turn to the second answer to my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? And here's the word, me. Why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer to that is only Jesus could. Nahum 1.6, who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. No one can stand before the indignation of God's fury and anger and power for sin. His fury is like fire, he says. Mountains topple before the Almighty. 
I don't know if you've ever stood before a man who has an intimidating presence, and maybe you've displeased this person, and maybe children, you might remember that maybe with your fathers when you were very young, and how intimidating he might seem to you, and how you trembled and quaked at his indignation, and maybe that was sinful even, his indignation. But you remember how you just feel frightened before the presence of one who has some presence and seems angry at you. What will it be like to come before the Almighty in his indignation? I don't care who you've been before who has been wroth with you. You can't imagine what it would be like to come before the Almighty with his indignation for sin. Your heart would almost explode if God would allow it. It would. Would you want to be in hell forever with that fury unleashed at your sin? Minute by minute, moment by moment, all you have is the anger of the wrath of the Lamb? It's incredible. It's an awful thought. It would shatter your mind when we thought on the doctrine of hell. Who could stand before it? Now, that's the question, who could stand before it? And were Jesus a mere man like the, the, the Jesus of the cults, he could not bear the wrath of God for even one sinner. He could not bear the wrath of all of us who will come to the communion table. You think of how many will come to the table. He couldn't bear the wrath of just us at the table. And how many are God's elect? Far more than in this congregation. But what did uh, God say to Abraham? Your descendants will be as numerable as the stars of heaven. Have you ever looked on the... You can't really get a good look here in Dallas. But have you ever looked on the Milky Way and thought on what Abraham might have seen that night? That's how many, as it were, a picture for your faith, how many Christ had to atone for. And in the book of Revelation, there is a number no man can number that is saved. Think of the magnitude of God's wrath. Think of the multitude of sinners who could stand before him. Certainly no man, no mere man. It is staggering then when you think of the weight, and now you understand Psalm 22 verse 1, the pure weight of God's fury upon the soul of Jesus Christ. It is hard, uh, you know, What's the saying? One death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. It is impossible to convey to you unless God helps you and me to understand the brunt of what Jesus took on that blast on the cross. And that's where Christ's full identity astonishes us and leaves our mouths agape. He is the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God in the flesh. Colossians 2.9 says, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Jesus. Here he is on the cross in an inseparable hypostatic union, a union of two natures, the divine nature and the human nature bound together in the Son of God. This is the mystery of godliness. God was in the flesh, come to bear the wrath of God for us to save us. You think about this, right? If the incarnation was a thing of great wonder and the angels of heaven were astonished at the incarnation, what must the holy angels have thought that day on the cross as they beheld the Son of God on the cross, taking the sins of all of his people upon his own person, the wonder of the Son of God nailed to a cross in the human nature to take the sins and the wrath that was deserved for his people that he deserved to pour out on them, he pours out on himself in a way of speaking. It's astonishing. It's a thing of wonder. But if this is so, how could he have said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, his human nature did not separate from his divine nature. That is impossible. But what is happening at this time is the divine nature of Christ is not giving any comfort to his human soul. 
Comfort had been taken away from him from Gethsemane. And in these three hours, he faced the total loss of it to feel wrath only. His sense of the divine nature then was of wrath, not of comfort and not of consolation. And this is what causes the Savior who had known the comfortable presence of God for 33 years, as no man ever has, to cry out in such agony. All the love, all the comfort, all the aid, all the help had evaporated. When he contended with the Pharisees, and there was his divine nature. There, when he healed, and there is his divine nature. Now, all he senses is wrath and anger towards sin. He had come under divine justice. Friends, if we had to speak of such things, we would have to speak in a whisper and not a shout. These are holy things. This is holy ground. Far too holy for us to tread on. You sense a bit of what he felt in Psalm 22 as we sang it. I am a worm and no man. We have to be filled with awe and reverence of how low the Son of God brings himself. Well, no mere man could withstand God's wrath, but his soul was being upheld by his divine nature. Now, there's no comfort for him in that. This is merely to keep his human soul from collapsing under the weight of God's wrath. Mysteriously, God enables Jesus to withstand his own fury. This is what's going on. There's no comfort. It's as though he's being pressed on the altar, which is his divine nature, upholding him. But all he feels is the strain and the pressure and the anger of God on his soul. And he would have wilted were it not for his divinity to uphold him. Here is the mystery of godliness and how man can be saved. And it's staggering. You are told in Hebrews 9.14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. That's his divine nature there. He's offering himself and his divine nature is the eternal spirit by which he offered himself and his blood to God. Hebrews 9 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So blood must be spilled. Blood must be shed. Blood must be offered to God. For the atonement, his blood must be shed. But what, have you ever thought on this sinner? Oh, with all of our sins and how great they are. What is the blood of Jesus worth? As the blood of a divine person, it has infinite value. It's not divine blood. It doesn't become something divine, the blood in itself. But as it belongs to the divine person, he counts that blood of his human nature as his own. And so what is the blood of God worth? What sin of yours can it not atone for? What sin of yours, believer, has it not atoned for? And you fear he has not cleansed you of. Infinite value. This is the blood of God, Acts 20, 28. So when you think of it this way, who is the person nailed to the cross under God's wrath? It is the Son of God. The second person of the Holy Trinity was truly nailed to a cross. The second person of the Holy Trinity is the one sacrificed for your sins. Can you doubt that you are saved, Christian, if these things are so? Jesus giving God infinite value in his one great and for all sacrifice. And that's why And I've said this before, I have to meditate on it often, and I will say it many times, God willing, until I am taken into glory. This is why the apostle, in that verse by which he lives his whole life, does not say, Jesus Christ the man loved me and gave himself for me. But he says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, a divine person. God loved me, and God gave his self for me. Be astonished, congregation. Be utterly astonished at what the atonement has brought to you. God himself giving himself for you, the chief of sinners, to save you. So, returning to the angels, what astonishment there must have been in heaven amongst the heavenly host to see the Son of God nailed to a Roman cross for the love of his own people. The atonement must have been a thing of marvel to them. 
Well, the angels, as we worship God now, are here observing all things. Hebrews 12 tells us this. And if they're still in astonishment over what the Son of God has done every time that bread is broken and the wine is poured, how can they be in astonishment but you, the Christian, not be? Let them not be the only ones in observance today who are in astonishment over what God has done for you and me, that he loved these people. There's no atonement for the angels, none. The the fallen angels are done. But for the angels to see that God loves these people so much that he would take on their nature to live for them and die for them and atone for them, they're astonished. Are you? Are you? Am I? When I pour the wine, in effect, it will be, this is the blood of God that is shed for your sins. Incredible. I question if we have the wonder and awe that we ought as we take of the supper. Let us adore and worship God for all he has done. Well, time is slipping, but having understood his divinity, now you understand his humanity as well. Even, right, I I think far too often all unbelievers see when they think of Christ crucified, maybe even their heart breaks in in a certain sort of way naturally over him dying on the cross is all they see is like a perfect man, a good man maybe they might say who's broken. But there's more to Christ than that. Certainly, he is a divine person. But let us never forget that he is a perfect man as well. The spotless lamb of God. Just as the animals in the Old Testament were meant to be spotless, so is Jesus, the perfect sinless man, the human embodiment of holiness and charity and faith. In fact, his perfection as a man was demonstrated in his uttering, my God, my God. Those are words of faith. Those are words of faith. He continued to trust that God was his God. Though God had withdrawn comfort, Christ had not withdrawn faith. He never would disown God with bitterness. How many are tempted in bitterness in a trial? How many of you have come under a trial and you are tempted to be bitter towards God? You might say, call me Mara. I am bitter at God. And here the Savior lives by pure and holy, chaste faith. He says, though you do not hear my roaring, you are my God. I will not disown you. Psalm 22.8 reveals God's enemies would say, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. As you know, the enemies of God did that and said that in verse 43 not even realizing the irony that they are speaking the 22nd Psalms prophecy of themselves. But they spoke truth. He did trust that God would deliver him when the atonement was over. And this is the difference between Christ enduring hell's wrath on the cross and the sinner in hell. The sinner in hell will never say, my God, my God. Won't, he will hate God, he will clench his fist at God, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but there will never be, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's why the sinner in hell is never released from it. They will continue in their anger and hatred and unbelief. But Jesus, as a man, was filled with faith, even when the greatest trial filled his soul. These three hours on the cross then you might consider to be the most intense exercise of faith in the history of the world. As he knows what's coming, the joy that is set before him, he endures it all, despising the shame and despising the agony of his soul, knowing what comes at the end is glory. But you imagine, as you yourself have felt in great trials, what it's like faith seeming very tenuous at best. And here is the Redeemer. You think of how totally we're saved, utterly forsaken by God, feeling it, his wrath pouring on his soul, no loved ones there for comfort. Christ's disciples, his friends had fled from him. 
Last time you heard how Jesus had sent Mary and John away. There are no comforters for him, only mockers. He suffers all of this, and his faith does not crumble at all, not one bit. Job crumbled under far less. He began to be bitter with God. But Jesus did not, would not, and could not. My God, he said. More perfectly than Job, Jesus believed, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. No matter what you do to me, O God, I will trust you and I will never disown you. His faith believed there was joy set before him, even a communion table set this day at the Dallas RPC. He knew it, and he endured it all in view of it. He believed at the end of those three hours, he would say, it is finished, so that you who are the apple of his eye would be reconciled to God. He knew also only he could save his bride. By faith, he knew it, and by faith, he endured it. So we considered the second answer, only Jesus could. Let's conclude briefly with the final answer, my God, to my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is simply this, the love of God. Let us never forget that because God loves the elect, he turned his face against his own son. That is portrayed at the table set. In the setting of the table, he says to you and to me as well, God so loved you that he gave you his only begotten son. Here at the table for our senses, for the weakness of our faith, so that you would have a tangible token of it, is Romans 5, 8 through 11 made visible. But God commendeth or demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? Wrath through him. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received what? The atonement. All that has been signified in Psalm 22. While we were yet sinners, the cross of Christ shows us God's love. This sacrament is a visible sign of it, believer. Have you doubted it? Do you know it? Have it rekindled? When the bread is broken, a demonstration of God's love. When the wine is poured, a demonstration again of God's love. Tokens, kisses from God to you. See how I love you. See how I have loved you. This is not some senseless ritual. It says, I am by love saved from the wrath of God by him pouring his wrath on the one who is the beloved. Faith sees Christ's atonement as in Romans 5, and sees God's love in the atonement and says, I have received the atonement and so I know I have received God's love. Can you plumb the depths of God's love knowing what he has done to his son? For all eternity, it'll be impossible for you to plumb the depths of it. And so as you take each element, you say, oh my soul, this is a token of Christ's love, of God's love. This is a kiss from him. God gave me the one who is altogether lovely to be made sin for me. My Savior, willingly out of love, died for me. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Love, through and through, as you read in Ephesians 1. But let us remember as we come to the table, the process by which Christ laid down his life. The, the, the process, right, is, today men are executed, they get some anesthesia, and they are put down by some chemical, and it's all very painless, more or less, and it's over with quickly. But remember the process by which Christ demonstrates his love in which he died for you. It wasn't just the beatings and the scourgings, yes, that draws our heart, with pangs of love, but also the wrath of God Almighty was involved in him laying down his life for us so that when we think of John fifteen thirteen, when he says, greater love hath no man than this, all of that is involved. 
in laying down his life for you. It's not just he lays down his life like on a table or a bench and then it goes to sleep. The process is excruciating in body and soul. The sacrament shows infinite love, infinite forgiveness, infinite mercy. Again, if you are loved of God, is there any sin that Christ cannot forgive? No, absolutely not. Well, our Savior dies in triumph. He's not dead now. He's raised to God's right hand. But he died in love and he died in triumph, saving you. And Jesus had all of Psalm 22 in his mind and heart when he began to cry, my God. His faith was in the end of the psalm as well. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that you're going to eat and worship literally. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. We partake of the man of faith at the table who is now risen and at God's right hand and he will feed us from heaven on his body by his and blood by his spirit. And you think of the prophecy there. Here we are, a people who are yet to be born. And here we are at the ends of the earth from Jerusalem, even in Dallas, Texas. And have we not declared his righteousness this day? All the promises of God are yea and amen. The man of faith knew it on the cross. The Lord's atonement then was definite and sure. And so we come rejoicing because the Lord Jesus uttered these words. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You and I never will. We sing of his experience in the 22nd Psalm and not ours. A writer of old said it well. Jesus entered the awful darkness that I might walk in the light. He drank the cup of woe that I might drink the cup of joy. He was forsaken that I might be forgiven. Believer, come with a solemn joy at the table. Say, O oh, my soul, he that is altogether lovely, my beloved, my best friend, loved me so greatly that he was forsaken for me to forgive me of my own trespasses against his own person. How greatly I am loved of God. May God bless our meditation on Christ's sufferings that the sacrament will greatly nourish our souls. Amen. May God bless his word. Let us arise for prayer if able. O Lord, our God, thou art holy. And we have approached holy ground in this text as we considered the Savior's sufferings, as we've affectionately meditated on him and the love of God shown on the cross. O God, bless this word to our hearts and minds and our souls. May we perceive Christ as though crucified among us. And may we see at the table then what the word has portended. Lord, if there are any here upon which the wrath of God abides for their unbelief, take away their unbelief and give them Christ. May this be the day by which they call on the name of the Lord. And for those of us who have come this day with a feeble faith, but faith nonetheless saying, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief and have said, Increase my faith, O God, at the table. We pray that thou wouldst have done so. And we pray these things for the glory of Christ and in his name. Amen.